Ever think you could do a better job than those so-and-sos at Queen's Park or on Parliament Hill? Ever wonder what it would be like to run for office to replace them? Writer Noah Richler did. And in the last year's federal election campaign, he stood as the NDP's candidate for Toronto St. Paul's, the riding we're in right now. His new book is called The Candidate, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, and it documents his epic learning curve as the candidate. And the candidate joins us now. Hi. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Lovely to have you here. Well, I've heard of people writing books because they ran and won. I've heard of people writing books because they ran and came oh so close to winning. Yours is the first book by anybody who ran and came third. So what made you think there would be a story in that? Well, uh, in fact, there were 1,454 losers last year. Um, 338 got in. And it was actually surprising to me that uh, when I decided I would write a book, that I could not find an account of campaigning from the ground. As you say, there are plenty from the top. So it felt important to me that way. Um, I didn't enter to write a book. I will confess there are moments I thought it wouldn't be a bad idea. I can remember, and, and I do recount, going to a Toronto International Film Festival party in a, one of the uh, wealthier parts of the riding. And my riding is, a, well, our ride, the riding we're in, I should say, it's not my riding, is um, especially wealthy. And um, the host of this party said to me, uh, let's take a look at my sign, because my team had been able to plant a great big orange NDP sign on his lawn, really because his, his fixer was a sympathizer, not for the host politics particularly. And so we went out and there were valets pushing cars this way and that and chaos was arriving and Cardinal Official and the guy looked at the sign and went, nice, does it come in any other colors? <laughs> and at that point I thought, well, I've got to be able to tell that story sometime. But it, I really, I, I did not enter the campaign to, to write about it. It's important for me to get that across because in good faith I was trying to chuck some ideas into the ring. No, which you did, but, and this is where I want to follow up because while you come from a small P political family, uh, people obviously know your dad's writing, they remember Daniel sure. from this place as yeah. well. Um, you know, you, yeah, my, my father, you've never uh, run for anything. No, my father did get me to canvas. My father, Mordecai Richler, the late great Canadian novelist, uh, resident in Montreal, did get me to uh, distribute flyers for Nick Aftermar, who was running at the time. And for but Montreal I'm sure City it was council, I guess. Um, no, for the NDP. Um, let's see. I think it was provincially. Okay. Um, and I'm sure it was just to earn him points at the bar, but uh, I did it reluctantly. <laughs> so why did you do. run for this office, given that there's really no history of running for office in your family? Well, I'm a political fellow. I think even of my, uh, my first book was a book about was a cultural portrait of Canada that looked, used uh, storytelling as a way in. My last book was a very angry book about how we talked ourselves into and out of Afghanistan. But I've always thought of myself as a, a political writer. But uh, I wasn't really doing it for personal gain. I was doing it just to elevate the debate. I was, like a majority of Canadians, fed up with the perversions of, of uh, the Harper government in the last years especially, and was feeling quite despairing. And it was only at the moment that I watched uh, Dennis Edney stand on the steps of an Edmonton courthouse and he'd managed to get bail for Omar Khadr and say, uh, I believe Harper's a bigot and I believe he hates Muslims. And I mean, it was irrational of me to feel it, but it felt as if there was no blowback and that something had changed and that the, he wasn't going to be sued, but also that the Canada, I thought, had um, dissipated was possibly merely dormant. And I'm going to sound awfully like a liberal now, but I wanted my Canada back. Well, I mean, that's the next question, which is, okay, having decided you're not a conservative, having decided you want to run for office, why decide on the NDP as opposed to the liberals? Well, I thought it was very important to show that, and uh, I don't want this to come across as vainglorious, but that a reasonably intelligent fella thought that the NDP were a viable alternative. I do think Mulcair was, um, you know, an honorable man, and uh, that a, a third party was a good idea. That's what he, I did. He's an honorable man, but you couldn't get him on the phone. No, You tried no. like hell to get a single phone call with your leader. Well, I did finally get one during the, the, the campaign. It took a while. Yeah, yeah, and I'd been protesting that, you know, the NDP had no position on either arts or sports, and these two extremely important fulcra. You know, sports is actually an area of individual accomplishment, and it's true, Harper did use it for sort of flybys by the forces, but uh, it's also the place where frontiers for human rights are constantly being pushed forward to include women, to include people of different ethnic minorities, to include the physically challenged. Um, and it, the NDP was disinterested. You I felt could never needed... get that on their agenda. No, no. Do but you know, you know 15 year olds knew more than me about politics. And I, I stupidly thought when I went in, they'll be phoning and calling me and asking me for my position on ISIL or some help with culture. <laughs> of course, that didn't happen. That didn't happen either. Yeah. Do you know why there, were, there was so much apparent disinterest in what you thought about various issues that, that you thought would be relevant to the people who lived in the riding whose votes you wanted? 
Well, you know, uh, I am actually sympathetic to the folk above. I mean, if you know anybody who runs a company, and I'm sure you do, after a while, most bosses lament that, you know, their job has become one of human resources. And, you know, the, the guys in, in Ottawa, the guys at the top, had to mind 338 candidates. And I'm sure that um, they were just, you know, waking up each morning, crossing their fingers that no further embarrassment would come their way. That said, there was tremendous freedom in my campaign and running in um, the riding of Toronto St. Paul's where so little was expected of me because above and beyond the fact that the NDP is a kind of grassroots uh, party, um, I was able to create a campaign of my own invention. Right. Why did you not choose to run somewhere where you had a shot of winning? Well, I didn't really have great choice. I came into the game very late. I had a romantic idea of running in the park of Nova Scotia where I spent a good deal of time and like Newfoundland's Joey Smallwood, you know, walking, knocking on every door and making a, a real virtue of the actual physical walk and around this great uh, horseshoe-shaped uh, riding of, of uh, uh, West Nova and Nova Scotia. Um, and I remember relating that to the campaign organizer and there was a kind of pause on the phone and he said, well, it's hokey. But it works. But he, he, he wanted me to, they wanted me to run in Toronto where they felt the ideas would be discussed. And that's where, really why I was in it. Let's show the picture of the two people you ran against. One was Marty McDougall, who was the Conservative candidate. That's her on the left. The other is Car Carolyn Bennett, who, as you point out, delivered almost all the babies in this riding. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a story that people liked to repeat. You know? yeah. <laughs> well, because um, it's true. And she obviously won, and she won big. Did you ever think possibly if all the stars aligned, that maybe you could win? Um, yes. I mean, and that's because uh, there's no other way to campaign than to believe you could win. I mean, one of the things that's tremendously moving, and I try to get across in what is a sort of novel-like narrative, though it's entirely factual and documented, is uh, that the candidate is, and these were lessons I learned, but one cog in a, a very large enterprise and certainly not the boss. And you can't lead, you know, as I was doing, 100 plus volunteers who aren't even interested in meeting you particularly because they're running for some idea of a better candidate, not even the party, so, you know, I'm sure the candidate is important, but that's what's motivating mm -hmm. these people. And that extraordinary wave of energy did carry me very far. And it, I can't imagine doing that and thinking I'm not going to win from the beginning. You have to have that rational hope. You know, it, it works in Quebec in 2011 and it works for Kathleen Wynne's Liberals in the last election mm -hmm. and it worked in Alberta. That may have actually been a bad thing for the uh, federal campaign, hmm. however. So it sort of took their eye off the ball. The Notley victory in Alberta yeah, uh, may have so. been yeah, unhelpful. Because yeah. hmm. certainly everybody thought the opposite at the time. No, and it, but I could feel already it was making them giddy. I mean, even my own appro um, sort of the approval to contest, first of all, the nomination in, in the riding came quite late and was delayed a little bit by the Notley victory. And I, you could sort of feel them from afar getting overexcited about what that meant. Hmm. You are maybe the poster child, maybe Exhibit A in... Everything you've ever said or written will come back to haunt you during a campaign. And that sure happened, especially with your social media history. Can you sure. talk about that? Well, it, it, you, you are vetted. Um, I don't know how well you're vetted. Um, I felt sympathetic to the guys having to go through as a writer. You're a writer, too. I mean, that's a hell of a lot of material to have to, you know, filter. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in truth, my first vetter is my wife, Sarah McLaughlin, who typically would be standing behind me and even from behind could recognize the smirk of me fooling around on social media platforms and she would tell me, don't do it. And she's and I, got chops. Tell the people what she does. <laughs> she's the uh, president and publisher of the House of Anansi. They do the Massey lectures. They've got a terrific record. Um, but most of all, she's a fantastic uh, uh, mom and partner. And um, I haven't always heeded that advice. Uh, <laughs> so I'm somewhat outspoken. And a number of these posts were Curiously, after I uh, produced a video that had a tremendous amount of views that I can authentically claim to have gone viral, uh, that ir had irritated the Liberal Party enormously, three newspapers within 24 hours, La Presse, uh, the Toronto Star and the Ottawa Citizen, had um, scarless Facebook and Twitter posts that I had written. And I did actually manage to speak to one of the journalists and ask that journalist, uh, uh, was this ma material handed to you? or did you scour? And the journalist said, I did not scour. Um, but this is the nature of politics. That is opposition research for And, you. you know, it was used, and, it, um, and it's one post especially was, uh, to my mind, just badly written, in which I called Harper a pathological psychopath and regret that I overwrote the post, that one word or the other would have been enough. But in truth, you know, I had sort of taken them down for people who understand social media off public viewing. So technically, my so-called Facebook friends were the only ones that would have seen these posts. And I had been warned by my party to take them down and hadn't thought of it. But I think 
I do believe in the Freudian, and I think a part of me was not interested in taking them down. Um, that that attempt to cover up is in a sense more of a deceit, um, and, um, slightly more embarrassing to me than what I might have written. And when the Fuhrer came, I did say to my party, look, I've written a column, I can publish it, it says, sorry, I'm not saying sorry. Um, and I sound like someone who regrets that he had not yet learned from Trump that what I really should have said is, I didn't write them, it's a lie, <laughs> it's a Liberal Party set up, but no, more seriously. Um, I thought it would have been important just to stand and change the conversation. Um, say, sure, you know, I wrote that stuff, but if you actually wanted to, uh, if you had done your homework, you could have found more obnoxious things that I said in articles where I can't claim to have written in the passion of the moment. So I'm still actually, um, don't regret not having taken them down. I think it's, um, these are tactics of irrelevance that obscure uh, and are the issues, and that's why op oppo research or opponent research by other parties digs them up. These are take, the rules of the game, though. Yeah. But somebody, at some point, a, a politician will do this and just say, mm. so, so what? Mm. And we'll you, move on. You referenced a, uh, a much viewed YouTube video that you put together. I've got to say, it was a very clever piece. Let's take a look at it if we can <laughs> right now. Sheldon, roll it if you would. This is what's happening to millions of Canadians in 10 years under Stephen Harper. I'll tell you what's happening to millions of Canadians. They're suffering through a ridiculous ad for a campaign full of pie-in-the-sky promises the Liberals can't possibly keep, but that would send Canada into a tailspin. Ow. A $30 billion deficit? Sure. Here's the truth of it. Justin's plans are to spend money the party doesn't have and doesn't have to account for. There's only one man and one party who's standing up for Canadians and going to bat for the benefit of all. And that's Tom Mulcair. How much input did the party have in that? Um, I, I've had referred everything upwards. There, there was a lot of anxiety around these, but um, they accepted that, my arguments. That, that, that is a damn fine ad, any way you look at it. Uh, most of all, the, the worry was that um, uh, conversation about the videos might have distracted from the campaign at the center. That's a metaphor for your whole party's campaign in some respects. It yeah, was, it was a too bit like timid a, in many ways. Absolutely. Well, it was also, it, it resisted, it was like a freighter that requires 30 miles to change course mm -hmm. when in effect, and we can all be wise after the fact, you need to be nimble as a, as a sailboat and tack easily. I think that, for instance, on the deficit issue, about which Mulcair had little choice because if he had come out for deficits, everyone would have recalled Bob Ray's NDP deficits and mm -hmm. skewered him. But I think if he had simply said, uh, look, I, I want to balance the books, I don't want to spend party that the government, not the party as I say in the video, but not that the, the government doesn't have, mm -hmm. um, but I'm relieved to know that Canadians are prepared to go into debt should we need, then it's, it's gone as an issue. Mm -hmm. You haven't handed the, the um, uh, rival party a huge um, bonus. Why didn't they figure that out? Uh, I just think there was, I, I don't, uh, I, it's, it's still difficult for me to pretend to, to know better. I don't want to come off sounding that way, but it was just not a nimble campaign. I mean, I would have done it completely inversely. I would have stressed the extraordinary resources of a party that was the party of uh, diversity, that was the national party. It had, I thought the, um, you know, the fact that we had such interesting candidates, young, old, native, uh, of, of various communities from coast to coast, true representation in every province, uh, should have been the thing that the party pushed from the beginning. <laughs> Sheldon, I'm on page five at the top here, because in spite of it all, um, well, here's what you say. The privilege of a freely contested election was never to be taken for granted, even in Canada. Talking about volunteers, they were contributing, as so many other friends and then strangers would come to do, to this most basic of democratic acts being replicated in hundreds of campaigns across the country, led by business people, lawyers, and career politicians, but also by artists, carpenters, doctors, educated farmers, healthcare providers, journalists, mechanics, soldiers, and students, by aboriginals, Asians, blacks, Christians, Hindus, Jews, Sikhs, Muslims, and Tamils. This but a portion of the country's participating, peaceable diversity and consensus worth upholding. Elections mattered. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you are remarkably free of cynicism about the whole thing, which I think is lovely. Yeah, no, Have no. I read that right? Yeah, no, I, I love my country, and I, and I think it's, uh, I was very moved by the fact of, you know, I did a little accounting at one point, and I, if I had, you know, I had about 100 volunteers on my campaign, there, there were 1,792 campaigns, if there were 40 volunteers on each, that's, and I'm sure there were double, there's already uh, 70, 75,000 people coming out to work for uh, their idea of a better Canada, and I found that uh, immensely moving. Um, and I think it is something that we should appreciate. Uh, it's not 
you know, multiculturalism is no longer something that distinguishes Canada particularly, but I would say it's, it's very advanced and it's um, not resented. It's fundamentally a part of the fabric. And, and that, we may do it better than anybody else in the world. I think we do. Hmm. I think we do. You know this question's coming. <laughs> you ever going to do this again? Not write uh, a book. I mean, run for sure. office. I, I wouldn't do so with the support of my family, and at the moment, I don't have it. But my sweet <laughs> revenge is that uh, of you know the notes from neighbors and friends we've had. Um, you know, I worked hard to include the testimony of other people um, working on the campaign, and one of them is Sarah. I describe her as not the political wife, and people are now writing her and saying. God, you come off really great in the book. I'd vote for you. <laughs> so, so there may be another campaign no. in the family, but it might not be yours. Yeah, but I would I, I'd say to anybody else, uh, don't be cynical, give it a go. Good stuff. Fear and loathing on the campaign trail. The book is called The Candidate. Noah Richler, great to have you here at TVO. Oh, Thanks so much. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.